Welcome. If you're watching this video, you're likely either the parent of a student who will enter high school in the near future, or you're the student who will enter high school. Glad that you're here. What we would like to share with you over the next few minutes is some key information we have learned in planning the high school at Cornerstone Charter Academy in Greensboro, North Carolina. This information is critical in planning a high school experience which prepares your student for the future, not for the past. Let's start by asking a simple question. What comes to your mind when you hear these two words? High school. Lots of pictures may form. For many of us who are parents, we have memories of high school. Hopefully yours are as fond as mine. Those memories may be different for different people. We went to different schools at different times in different environments. But there are also likely several similarities. So what are some of those memories? Well, we remember the classes that we had. English, math, science, social studies, foreign language. We remember the great teachers we had and some teachers maybe not so great. We remember all the things that we learned. Remember the sports and activities we were a part of, the way we developed physically, the teamwork that we learned. And we also remember social activities, clubs we were involved in, relationships that we formed. Many of those relationships last for a lifetime. But really, as you compare the high school design experience of our memories, not much has changed when you compare it to the high schools of today. Many of the same classes are taught in the same way with the same extracurricular activities. Yet many employers today, they're increasingly concerned about what we're producing with our educational system and comparisons of the U.S. with other countries are increasingly less favorable. So the question becomes for us, does this system, does it effectively prepare students for the college and the career experiences of the future? In order for us to answer that, let's think about some of the things we might ask about that future. So let's consider the future by asking three questions. We'll do it in a game show format and see how well you can do in looking at life 20 years from now. <clears throat> and now for the first question. If all the known information today formed over thousands of years took up one box, how many boxes would be needed to hold known information 20 years from now? There's our one box of information over there on the left hand side of the screen. How many more boxes would be needed? Two more? Five? Ten? Well, the correct answer is 10,000, 100 times more boxes than shown on the screen. And that estimate's probably low. IBM estimates that 20 years from now, the time that it will take for informational world to double will be less than a week. The point here is that the future holds rapid change, and it holds more information than one can ever hope to learn. The key is, is to be able to access that information, to synthesize it, and then use it for whatever purpose you have. And now for the second question. Compared to 40 years ago when high school options were similar to those today, how many times more college graduates would be available for a job? How many times more? Well, there's a college graduate on the left-hand side of the screen looking for a job. How many times more people is that person going to have to compete against to get that job? Two times more? Five times more? Well, the correct answer is 54 times more. Why is that? Well, it is a result of global competitiveness, increasing college graduation rates in other countries, and really the changing value of a U.S. college degree. Uh, college degrees for U.S. grads are increasing, however the jobs that are connected to college degrees are decreasing. And now for the third and final question. What are likely to be the types of jobs with the highest demand and highest pay 20 years from now? What do you think? Doctors? Lawyers maybe? Well, it turns out this is the trick question. We really have no idea what those jobs and careers will be. Many predictions indicate that over 50% of the jobs 20 years from now do not exist right now. Why is that? Well, it's a result of increasing complexity in the world. And that means a lot of the jobs of the future are ones that haven't been created and they'll really be mixtures of current careers. Maybe you'll have a career that's a mixture of biology and law. We'll call that a bioattorney. The point is, is that as your children graduate college, they'll probably change careers many times and come into careers that had previously not been created. So to summarize, our world is changing and it's changing in several ways. It's experiencing exponential change, for instance, in the rate of information growth and the rate of processing speed. The world is increasingly more complex and interconnected. Uh, you can see that just in terms of the way social networks have grown and the impact that they've had. The world is increasingly more globally competitive with labor markets for different countries having to compete against each other. 
there's more data and information being created and greater access to that data being created. So that really means that you need to have different skills in order to be able to be successful. And finally, jobs and careers are being defined and created in new ways. These kinds of changes might lead some to be fearful or apprehensive. We want to create an educational system that creates students and graduates who believe that this provides a great opportunity. So really this changing world really drives a new set of skills that we need our students to have. This conclusion that new skills are needed is supported by a recent survey of corporate leaders conducted by the Center for Creative Leadership. That survey found that skills needed 20 years ago were greatly influenced by a mindset that really was born out of the Industrial Revolution many, many years ago. And that is, is that education should fill an empty-minded person with a static set of skills and knowledge. They call that technical mastery. So for a chosen career, say you want to be a doctor, you learn what doctors need to know, and you learn to do what doctors need to do. And then at the point of graduation, you would employ those skills and that knowledge for the remainder of your life, and you'd be set for life. But now technology is changing. Knowledge is being added. Careers are being redefined. And so the skills and competencies that are needed are much different now. Looking at what the survey revealed for 2012 and 2022, current workforce and future workforce, there's two different kinds of skills that this shows. Those skills shown in green are the kinds of skills and competencies that don't change over time. You always need to have those. Those that are shown in blue are skills and competencies that as time progresses are of increasing importance. These are the kinds of skills that we need to make sure our students have. We've done extensive research in future skills and the findings that we have are incredibly consistent with what you see here. But it's more than just skills and competencies. It's also mindsets and attitudes. The same Center for Creative Leadership survey collected corporate leaders' assessments of next generation strengths and limitations. The strengths that you see here, they indicate a leaning towards future skills, the things that are going to be important towards the future. But the shame is, is they're not being developed and not being taken advantage of by the current education system. And in fact, many of these kinds of things may actually be discouraged by that system. On the right hand side, you see some of the limitations that those leaders saw in terms of the next generation. These limitations are things that we need to address in order for our students to be successful with the future. And they're not being addressed in the current education system. So to summarize, our world is changing. I already mentioned our world is increasingly experiencing exponential change, increasingly becoming more complex and interconnected, having more global competitiveness, growing in terms of the access to more data and knowledge, and defining jobs and careers in new ways. These changes in the world apply new sets of skills that are going to be critical for our graduates to be successful in their careers. Unfortunately, the worldview that's taken by modern education systems is different. And because of that worldview, it has a on students, which does a poorer job in terms of preparing them for the future. Employers are asking for different kinds of employees than what we were producing. We look increasingly less favorable when compared to other nations. Something needs to change. I want to be clear. We are not talking about the impressive efforts of many well-intentioned educators and their well-thought-out strategies. What we're talking about is a systemic issue of culture and process. It's been said that culture eats strategy for breakfast and that bad process beats good people every time. Gardner says that current formal education systems still prepare students primarily for the past rather than for the possible worlds of the future. We need to prepare our students for the possible worlds of the future. Sir Ken Robinson says given the challenges we face, education does not need to be reformed, it needs to be transformed. So how do you transform education in order for it to be able to prepare people for the future? rather than for the past. It's our belief that real change is not top down. With a large system, it's very difficult to turn it around. So if it's headed to the past, it's going to continue to head to the past. Our belief is, is that hope exists in terms of doing things that are small. And that those small things might be future oriented and the things that are learned there, the real change that's created, that that could grow out and have an impact on other parts of the system. So in terms of skills, we need an educational process that considers the new skills, those future-oriented skills, as well as the academics and the sports and the social clubs in order to have whole person development. Let me tell you, as a college professor, I desire for all of my students to have all of these skills. But remember, we're not just talking about skills and competencies. We're also talking about mindsets and attitudes. 
Education now in many ways has disconnected the student from the actual topic and arranged the classroom so that students become passive. They're just trying to figure out what the teacher wants, what's going to be on the next test, what's needed to make the best grade. Students who walk down the hallway full of life walk into the classroom only to become passive. They show up with no expectations in the class in terms of the value of the content. In a college class that I have, people will come and they'll pay thousands of dollars only to come in and I ask them what they want to learn in the class and they say, whatever you want to teach us after they've spent thousands of dollars on the content. As a result of this disengagement, learning is shallow and it's short term. Studies show that elementary school students who are fairly engaged, 8 out of 10 are engaged, that drops to 6 out of 10 for middle school students and 4 out of 10 in high school. I'm scared to think about the engagement level in college where I teach. This degradation of engagement is also visible in a Gallup poll that shows how it drops from 5th grade to 8th grade to 12th grade. So what's the reason for this decline in student engagement? Well, we've already talked about education as designed for the past. There's also assumed uniformity. It believes that all students are the same. It has a view that students are mass-produced versus custom-crafted, and it fails to see the strengths that exist in the students. There's a failure to develop the whole person where you engage the heart as well as the mind, and the heart is the motivator in the educational process. Students feel like the educational process is disconnected because all the subjects are disconnected from each other, and they're often disconnected from practice in our real world. And because of this, as mentioned earlier, there tends to be a shallow grasp of the information and it tends to be lost. There's minimal retention. So we move from the engaged person on the left-hand bottom side of the screen to the disengaged person on the right-hand side. So the question becomes, how do you balance the academics and extracurricular activities of the past with the future skills that are needed? How do we prepare our students for the future given the skills, the knowledge, the mindsets, and the attitudes that they need? Well, there may be several approaches that you may take. One approach is that you might have a future-focused approach where you emphasize future skills, maybe technology skills. The issue with this is as you grow the technology skills, it de-emphasizes the academics and the extracurricular activities that are key for whole person development. Another thing you might choose to do is to emphasize academics. Maybe you establish an international baccalaureate program. Well, as this grows, it tends to decrease the emphasis on those other areas, so you have less emphasis on future skills as well as extracurricular activities. One other approach might be to, to emphasize the extracurricular activities, but it has the same impact as the other. It de-emphasizes the academics and the future skills that are so important for the future of our students. So what is the best way to balance the traditional areas of academics and extracurricular activities along with the future skills that are so important for our graduates? We believe that there is a singular best approach to this, and that singular best approach is through the integration of leadership, skills, mindset, and practice across the curriculum. Leadership does not push out or minimize any of these areas. It elevates academics, and it elevates extracurricular activities. It improves the experience for the students in each one of those areas. And there is no better way to characterize the future skills that we've looked at than to call them leadership skills. We would encourage you to watch our next video that describes the integration of leadership into our curriculum at Cornerstone Charter Academy. We also encourage you to learn more about Cornerstone's High School in Greensboro, North Carolina. You can go to the website cornerstone.teamcfa.org. Information about filling out applications for high school is shown on the screen. We thank you for your attention.